must find ways to sustain its benefit and avoid its fragmentation. It's a great pleasure to welcome to the program Mr. Fadi Shahadi, the President and CEO of, of ICANN, Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Mr. Shahadi will discuss how we can carry forward the cooperative spirit and work together to apply the net mondial principles to solve issues in concrete ways to enable an effective, uh, an effective and distributed approach to internet cooperation and governance. His career has been defined in building consensus and promoting collaborative technologies and practices. He has more than 25 years of experience in building and leading progressive internet enterprises, leveraging relationships with senior executives and government officials across Asia, Europe, the Middle East, and the Americas. Shahadi is a citizen of Egypt, Lebanon, and the United States. He was born in Beirut, Lebanon, to Egyptian parents, and left, and left then the war-torn country in 1980 at the age of 18. He speaks fluent Arabic, English, French, and Italian. Before joining ICANN as president and CEO in late 2012, he served as chief executive officer of Vocado LLC, a U.S. firm that is, that is a provider of cloud-based software for administration of educational institutions. Shadi is a graduate of Stanford University, where he earned a master's degree in engineering management. He, er he earlier earned a bachelor's degree in computer science from Polytechnic University in New York, where he graduated summa cum laude. Shahadi lives in Los Angeles with his wife of 25 years. They are parents of two adult sons. Please welcome Mr. Fadi Shahadi. Hassan, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Santiago Gutierrez, Vice Chairman Nizar Zekka, who was very generous in welcoming me. Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, thank you very much for welcoming me here. Today, I want to spend a little time talking about two, three things related to internet governance. But before I start, I just want to make sure we are aligned on why this is an important discussion today. The internet has become the platform for human solidarity. It has also become a very important platform for economic progress. Today, it is at the foundation of the economies of the world, the social fabric of the world, and also the political systems of the world. The internet is no longer uh, just an environment for our children and our families to connect using great applications like Facebook and otherwise, it has become now the blood of the economy. As you know, the Boston Consulting Group predicts that in 2016, in the G20 economies, the internet digital economy will drive about 4.2 trillion US dollars of economic activity. This is a significant growth. And today, we need to discuss how to make sure that the great resource of the internet remains what it is today, a resource for human progress, economic progress, and solidarity amongst human beings across the world. So I will focus first on frictions in the digital economy, because unfortunately, they're rising. We have many business leaders in this room, and I think many of us would agree that friction in the digital economy is an issue we should pay attention to. Then I will talk a little bit about internet governance, which is becoming a hot topic in every political, economic, and social circle I come in touch with recently. I'm sure you all experience the same. And finally, I want to spend a few minutes on ICANN, the organization which I had that has a responsibility, but only one part of the responsibility for ensuring the internet works well for everyone. So the BCG study, the Boston Consulting Group study, shows a six-year growth path that will get us from 
a little over two trillion to a little over four trillion. That's the good news. The bad news is most of that growth is in the G20 economies. So here in Guadalajara and in Latin America and in many other developing parts of the world, we are seeing that the internet is a huge engine of growth, but it has yet to occupy a significant portion of our growing economies, which means opportunity. The opportunity today is quite important for the developing world. The growth of the digital economy is now outpacing the growth of the physical economy almost in every sector. Therefore, huge opportunities. The question, of course, is what enabled that? Now, in the room here with us today, we have one of the very, very recognized globally individuals that has created the internet. Bob Kahn is sitting here with us. When you talk to people like Bob and others who were at the inception of this, you appreciate very quickly that what enables this internet to create this much growth is the fact that it has something called unique identifiers. The unique identifiers of the internet are critical. They're what make the internet one internet. And later, I will share with you a little bit how the management of these unique identifiers is so critical to keep that growth in the right direction. Now, as this digital economy continues to grow, everyone is paying attention. Governments, businesses, civil society, academics, technical people are all coming to the table and saying, well, how do we govern the internet? I remember after President Dilma Rousseff of Brazil spoke at the United Nations a year ago, it is, as you remember, there was a little incident where somebody allegedly listened to her phone calls. She was not very happy, as you remember. And she spoke at the UN and made a pretty powerful speech in which she asked the key question, who runs the internet? Who should run the internet? And therefore, the answer to this question has taken central stage in the geopolitical debate. Everyone wants to know who runs the internet. And I ask you, who should run the internet? Before I answer this question, before you answer this question, I want to let you know that the decision on how the internet is governed and who runs it is fundamental to the continued growth of the internet, as, as I said, as a tool for economic growth, as well as a tool for human solidarity. So let's not take this question lightly. Today, the technical parts of the internet are run by a series of organizations. One of these is ICANN, but we're not the only one. There is the IETF, where technical standards are created. There are the regional internet registries. In Latin America, you have LACNIC, based in Uruguay, that also distributes IP numbers to, to this part of the world. And there's the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, that decides all the content standards and shares them with the world, like HTML and XML. So there are a number of organizations doing this today. These organizations produce policies, they produce standards, they produce specifications, they produce best practices, and I think you and I would agree that it's working quite well. The internet is here today because those organizations have done their job. Therefore, the way to govern the internet should be built on what works today. And what works today, and I'm going to define it here for you, is a distributed internet governance ecosystem. Key word here is distributed. Those who are legal scholars will call it polycentric. Polycentric. Not one center, multiple centers. ICANN is one such center. It deals with one topic. 
there should be other centers in this ecosystem that address different parts of internet governance. As I'm sure Bob will, will tell you, the, the, the genius of the internet, the genius of the people who created this, including, including him, was to ensure that there isn't a center, that the network is intelligent at the edges, that there are different parts of the network that do different things. So simplistically, the governance of the internet should look like the internet. It should be distributed. It should be polycentric. And this distributed nature, as this picture shows, is also geographic, not just by topic. What does this mean? We need to manage the internet closest to where the issues are. So if an issue is very specific to Mexico, it should be solved in Mexico. It shouldn't be solved in Brussels or in Washington. If it's an issue that is related to the region, it should be solved in the region. And if it's a global issue, it should be solved globally. This concept in the law is called devolution, devolving the solutioning to the closest place where the problem exists. This also adds to the distributed nature of internet governance. So the goal is distributed, polycentric internet governance. How we get there is the question. One of the ways you hear a lot about is multi-stakeholder. You've heard the word many times. What does multi-stakeholder mean? It means it's not the goal to be multi-stakeholder. It's how we get to the goal. It means involving all the stakeholders in the decision-making process. Governments, businesses, civil society, technical people, the academic sector. Everyone needs to be at the table when decisions are made on how to govern the internet. It's worked today extremely well for the technical organizations. Now we need to take this methodology called multi-stakeholder and the goal of distributed governance and make it a way to address also non-technical issues. Non-technical issues. Because today, most of the solutions have been in the technical issues, such as what ICANN deals with. So, where do we go from here? A year ago, we started a little journey. And I'm showing you just a quick picture of that journey. Because the institutions that need to be put in place and the processes and mechanisms that are needed to be put in place to solve all technical and non-technical issues were not altogether available. So we saw people show up at the ITU meeting in Dubai a couple of years ago and raised their hand and said, where do we solve spam? And the ITU was ready to pass an actual treaty, a treaty between governments to solve spam. I think you would agree with me that we don't need a government treaty to solve spam. What we need is real solutions developed by technical, business, governmental leaders all together to address issues like spam and many other issues. So a year ago, the many leaders in the, in the internet governance space got together in Montevideo. So it all started here in your continent. And we issued a key statement in which we said, we must get together and agree how to solve issues of governance of the internet. It followed with the opening of an online dialogue called OneNet. And then we met with President Dilma Rousseff in Brazil on the heels of her speech at the UN. And we got her to agree with us that the solution to internet governance is not necessarily a governmental multilateral solution, but rather a multi-stakeholder solution. And once President Rousseff agreed with us, we held the, the now historic meeting called Net Mundial, which was held in Brazil before the other Mundial. But I think our Mundial was more important, despite what people think.
The Net Mundial was a very key moment where governments, businesses, technical organizations, academics, civil society got together by the thousands, offline and online, and agreed together on, for the first time, principles to govern the internet. We now have principles that unite everyone on how we govern the internet. This was the product of the Sao Paulo meeting. From there, President Tumas Ilves of Estonia got together with a group of us and we formed a panel. And that panel started describing what I called before the distributed internet governance ecosystem and how it will work. It was the first time we had an actual report from a multi-stakeholder group that included a president, multiple ministers, but also business leaders, the president of Samsung, from all over the world, and we produced an architecture for how the internet should be governed. Please look at that report. It is worth a read. From there, we then went to the WEF, the World Economic Forum, and Klaus Schwab and a group of us held a meeting in Geneva at the World Economic Forum headquarters that I think was a very important meeting in which we started consultations with the community how to take the principles of Sao Paulo and the distributed governance model that President Thomas Ilves defined, as you can see here, and how to take these forward to an action platform. The discussions were very useful. As a result, in the next two, three weeks, you will hear two new initiatives. And these are the last two you see on the slide. The first is an initiative from the World Economic Forum, a multi-year initiative to start a strategic dialogue within their community on internet governance. This is extremely important. And in fact, we already know that Klaus Schwab has invited many global political and business leaders to Davos, which is the main yearly meeting of the WEF, to discuss internet governance. And we know already that the President of China, Prime Minister of India, Prime Minister Modi, uh, many presidents, many CEOs have already confirmed they will be there to have that dialogue. So this will be a multi-year dialogue within the WEF community. And I think this is important, because now we have business and political leaders talking about how to govern the internet together. It does not replace the discussions we have here and the discussions we have at the uh, Internet Governance Forum. It complements them. It brings another community that has not been as close to this into the debate. Now, the last one above this, the Net Mundial Initiative, is very important. This is now where we take the learnings from Sao Paulo and from President Ilves' report, and we move to action. We will create a new initiative platform, and that platform will be a place to start solving internet problems. So never again do we have somebody standing up saying, how do I solve spam? We're gonna have a place where all the issues will be identified, all the available solutions will be identified, and when no solutions exist, we will coalesce a new center, as we said, polycentric, a new center where multiple people voluntarily and multiple organizations and governments will come together to solve an issue. This will be announced in the next few days as the Net Mundial Initiative. So a lot of activity. And believe me, this is new. This is new because if we don't solve it, then the current governance models, which are largely the product of the 20th century, with centers of control largely in the Western world, in the Northern world, will continue to try and prevail over the governance of the Internet. Frankly, I don't believe anyone here would agree that this is sustainable. It is time for all of us to govern our internet. No one should claim single control over the internet. And it is time for the Caribbean and Latin America 
the economies here that are now driving the growth in the world, to participate in the governance of the internet, not just in its use, not just in its leveraging as an economic tool, but a big and very important responsibility rests on our shoulders to participate in the governance of this resource. And if we don't, we leave a vacuum for the others. And then we say, how come we weren't consulted? Now is the time. Energize your businesses. Energize your governments. Every major business in Latin America should have people who understand public internet policy and how to influence it. And make sure it does not end up just being the governments. It doesn't mean we are leaving governments out. Governments must be in the debate. But businesses should be as well. Civil society should be as well. Every organ of the institutions in Latin America that cares about economic, social, or political issues need to be part of that debate. So let's pay attention to this evolving agenda, which is moving very fast as we proceed. Now, this simple slide was to show you the stages we're getting into. And I'm not going to take a lot of time on that because this is detail. But when you solve an internet governance issue, you move from issue identification, as you can see at the top, to mapping the solution to an existing uh, uh, good governance model. If you don't find one, then you need to formulate a solution. And then you need to implement the solution. The focus of the Net Mundial Initiative will be on the two blue circles. Because on the technical issues, we largely have good functioning institutions and solutions. It's the non-technical issues. The non-technical issues. I'll give you examples of non-technical issues that have not been addressed. I was just in Turkey. The Minister of Telecommunications in Istanbul is receiving every month hundreds of court orders to shut down websites. Any citizen in Turkey can walk to a judge, say, this site offends me. The site gives him a, the judge gives them a court order to shut the site. They walk to the telecom ministry, say, shut the site. The telecom ministry says, none of these sites are in Turkey. How do I shut them down? What is the process? They hired a lawyer in New York to go after these sites. Millions of dollars later, it didn't work. These are issues. We need to address them. Two weeks ago, the French president announced that he wants several sites taken down because they were inciting French citizens to join ISIS. He sent an order to various ISPs to close the sites in France. The ISPs complied. But the ISPs had contracts with the people that put the sites that were broken. Suddenly, they were being sued. What is the process of takedowns? Governments do do takedowns. It's a reality in the US, in Europe, and other places. There is no mechanism. There is no agreed approach so that businesses that host these sites, governments who want them shut down, and users who will be affected have a common agreed mechanism to address these issues. And the list of these issues is very long. It goes from child protection to child pornography to taxation on the internet, to uh, trade issues, to IP issues, protection of intellectual property. Today, a lot of these issues are either being solved, but people don't know where the solutions are, or they're not being solved. That's why these two blue circles are very key. Non-technical issues, we need to map solutions where they exist, and when no solution exists, we need to formulate a non-centric team to go and address this issue. And this should all be bottom up. It should be driven by business. It should be driven by all of us. Not top down, not centralized. If we centralize internet governance, it will not work. It will break. It will not keep up with the pace of technology. But if we do nothing, then someone will centralize it for us. They will. Why will they? Because that Turkish minister 
was frustrated. He needs an answer. Where does he go? Where are they going to go, you think? They will go to multilateral institutions they know very well. And they will demand solutions. They will. Because the internet is challenging governments today. The internet is transnational. It crosses borders. It's fast. Unlike air discussions and climate discussions, if you pollute in Guadalajara, it takes a few days for it to get to Los Angeles. But if you pollute the internet in Cairo, it gets to Los Angeles before you blink. The speed of the internet and the fact that it has no borders is challenging our governments. That doesn't mean we want it to continue to do this. What we need to do is create solutions that involve governments in a polycentric model that starts addressing the real issues that people are concerned with today. Okay, the last part of my talk is to come back to ICANN. At the end of the day, I am ICANN's president, and the reason I am interested and keen on the broader internet governance issues is because we are a model, we are a reference point for how internet governance has worked. It's not perfect, but it is working. After all, the things we manage at ICANN have been working uninterrupted, not even for a nanosecond, for close to 16 years. So it is important to appreciate that ICANN has done its job. Are we in a perfect condition? I would say not. We have things to do. So let me first start by making sure everyone appreciates why ICANN does what it does. This is a very simplistic picture. But if you think about the way you use the internet, there are, the internet is made up of thousands of networks. There is no one internet network, as I'm sure you all know. There are tens of thousands of networks. And I'm sure Bob will give me a better lesson when I'm off the stage on this, because he invented most of this. But essentially, you have all these networks. They're not united except by the fact they use the very good protocols that he and Vint and others put together. Then on the top part, you have the applications. Millions of applications. The most common one all of you know is email. But of course, the World Wide Web itself is an application. On your iPhone or your Google uh, Android device, you have hundreds of applications. So the internet is already fragmented up there and is deeply fragmented down there as well. There is no one internet. What makes it one internet is that the designers of this great network from the beginning understood we need unique identifiers. ICANN is responsible for these unique identifiers today that are not all of them, but specific ones that are now very prevalent in the world. The ones you know very well are IP addresses. Every device you have that talks to the net has an IP address or, or a, a derivative of it. And as we go to the Internet of Things, there will be more, a need for more and more IP addresses, hence IP version 6. One of the biggest investors in fabrics now is Intel. Why do you think Intel is investing in fabrics? Because almost everything we wear will eventually have some silicon. It will talk to the network. All these things will need IP addresses. I was in Dubai working at IBM when we made plants with IP addresses. So the plant can call the water system when it's thirsty and ask for water. So the plant was networked because of the dearth of water in Dubai. So with the Internet of Things, IP addresses will become very critical and there will be more demand for them. ICANN distributes all IP addresses in the world through a network including LACNIC in Latin America. That's the first identifier we manage. The second one is clearly websites, website names, the domain name system many of you use. So when you type www. Uh, witsa.org or uh, any website that is all managed through a system ICANN coordinates globally and that's why you never typed 
IBM.com and ended up at HP because the system works and it continues to work and it's our commitment to make sure it works. So these identifiers are what makes the internet look like one internet. And ICANN is responsible for these today. Now, when I arrived at ICANN two years ago, frankly, and I can speak, uh, uh, I guess, publicly and candidly about this, ICANN was very United States centric. Most of the staff was in the US. Most decisions were made in the US. And then on top of that, we still have a contract with the US government, whereby the US government has a very unique role in us managing these identifiers. From the start, I discussed this with our board of directors and we agreed that ICANN cannot remain a US-centric organization. And we proceeded immediately. I have tripled our staff. I have moved our headquarters from being only in Los Angeles to being in Los Angeles, Singapore, and Istanbul. I have opened offices across the region. When I started, we had no one in Latin America. Today, we have people in Bolivia, in Uruguay, in Mexico City, in the Caribbean, and we're adding and we're increasing our presence here. We're not just translating things in Spanish and Portuguese, as we used to do. We're actually localizing what we do. We're having people develop strategies here to drive what we do at headquarters. So this is the good old concept of building organizations that are outside in, not inside out. And ICANN was very inside out, I must admit. That's all changed now. We have 300 plus people all over the world, and ICANN is listening and building a global organization that serves everyone. And I'm hoping that our, uh, we have our next meeting is in Africa, uh, after Los Angeles, which is in two weeks, and then the meeting after that is in Latin America. So I look forward to come back and hopefully have a big meeting here in Latin America where thousands of people come from over 150 countries to join in the discussion of how to make ICANN more global. Now, I mentioned to you quickly the USG contract. So I don't want you to think I just passed over this fast, so let me just talk about it a little bit. Look, there's history here. A lot of the components of internet governance started from initiatives that came from the US government, including ICANN. ICANN was very much created through a directive that Bill Clinton and Al Gore established in the late 90s. That's why sometimes you hear Al Gore say, I invented the internet. In fairness to him, he actually had some doing in the creation of ICANN and in making the internet a commercial internet. However, they kept the contract. Let me explain to you what this contract does so everyone is clear. When I add a new top-level domain to the root of the domain name system today, I go through my multi our multi-stakeholder process, we go through it, and once we're done with the multi-stakeholder process, we go to the US government for final approval to add that name to the root of the internet. That's the case today we have asked the US government to give up this unique role now that ICANN is able to do it on its own. And on March 14th, after discussions with all parts of the US government, with approval from the White House, the US government announced that they intend to let go of this unique role. And I must tell you that whilst to the US from a US standpoint, this looks like the US is giving up something. In my opinion, and being also partly an American citizen, I must tell you, this is a great gain for the US to have made this decision. Because it shows in this subject, the moral and courageous leadership that is needed to really give up the internet for the world. To really say this is not ours, this is everybody's. So we should salute the administration for making that decision. But now having said that, it is our responsibility to make sure that that decision of intent actually comes through. 
So what were the conditions the American government established? One, everyone should be involved in how we replace the U.S. government role. Not Fadi, not ICANN, not any one group, not any particular sector, business, government, no, all of us. And we have now a whole process with thousands of people involved. These tracks have been established and we're working on them to ensure that everyone has a voice in how the U.S. government role is removed from ICANN. So please do get involved. Please find out if you don't know. We have a whole set of meetings tomorrow here to discuss how you can get involved in ICANN. Have your voice at the table. If you're not at the table, someone else will decide for you how the internet will be governed. So I think the commitment of the U.S. government is real, but their condition is equally real. If at the end of our process, People stand up and say, we were not involved, we were not given an opportunity. We might fail that test. The other condition, and only other condition the U.S. government put, is that whatever happens, the role of the U.S. government at ICANN cannot be replaced by another government, or by another set of governments, or by the U.N. as a multilateral intergovernmental organization. In other words, the U.S. wishes for all of us, all the stakeholders, to manage the internet and manage ICANN's transition together. And that's a great invitation to all of us. So I ask you to please take part of this. I'm done. I will ask my colleague, Rodrigo de la Parra, who is the Vice President of ICANN for the Caribbean, as well as the Latin American region. He's based here in Mexico City, to come first for all of you to meet him. That's Rodrigo. And for all of you to find out what are the activities ICANN is doing here at this great meeting that we are very happy to support. You may need to use the mic there, Rodrigo. And he will speak in Spanish, presumably there is, or in English, I don't know what he's planning to do. Please. Gracias, eh, Fadi, y buenos días a, a todos. Eh, en efecto, ICANN está ahora distribuido en, en las distintas regiones del mundo, y ahí me toca encabezar los esfuerzos que hace ICANN en América Latina y el Caribe. Y como parte de esta, de esta tarea hemos diseñado un plan estratégico para la región que ha sido construido justamente como nos comentaba Fadi, de abajo hacia arriba con todos los grupos de interés, gobiernos, sociedad civil, iniciativa privada, comunidad técnica, etc. Y uno de los proyectos que tenemos es un roadshow, que le hemos denominado el LAC y Roadshow, LAC y Roadshow, y la idea es tener distintas paradas en distintas regiones o subregiones de esta gran región de América Latina y el Caribe. Y nos toca ahora en este evento, en el marco del WCIT 2014, presentar la versión de México y Centroamérica. El día de mañana tenemos desde las 8 de la mañana hasta las 6 de la tarde en el Salón Moda una serie de eventos, empezando con la presentación del estudio de BCG que también comentaba Fadi en su presentación, con un análisis sobre la, digamos, el ranking o el desempeño de México en este índice de fricciones y vamos a contar con representantes del gobierno mexicano, representantes de, de la iniciativa privada, de la sociedad civil, de, de la comunidad técnica de México para analizar el desempeño de México y también vamos a tener este, una invitación para que conozcan cómo es que pueden involucrarse, cómo es que pueden ser parte de este modelo de múltiples partes interesadas y de esta internet distribuida. Este, tenemos gente de nuestra comunidad de negocios que hoy día participa en ICANN, en particular en, en, en lo que se refiere a los eh, proveedores de servicio de internet y conectividad. Entonces está la invitación abierta para que nos acompañen el día de mañana y finalmente vamos a hablar sobre temas de interés como el IPv6. Hablaremos de nuevos eh, negocios que hay en México, mexicanos que tuvieron a bien solicitar un nuevo dominio genérico de primer nivel. Ellos van a estar presentando eh, sus dominios, el punto REST y el punto VAR, son solicitudes de, de mexicanos y también tendremos dentro de nuestra región la presentación del punto LAT. Así es que quedan todos este, bienvenidos, invitados a, a nuestros eventos mañana otra vez de 8 a 6 de la tarde en el Salón Moda y finalmente yo quedo a sus órdenes para cualquier este, duda o aclaración.
Muchas gracias. Gracias, Rodrigo. Thank you all very much for taking the time. Please, please, when you leave here, let's work together to make sure the internet remains the neutral space it needs to be. Many people will try to take away from us this neutral space, but it's our space. Let's keep it neutral, please. And thank you for paying attention. Thank you, Secretary General Poisson. Thank you, Chairman Gutierrez and Nizar Zetka, Vice Chairman, for inviting me to be here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. Could you please stay for a sure. small gift? Please. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you so much. I have to tell you the immensity of your operation. I want to congratulate you and congratulate the entire ICANN staff for all the work they're doing. It's an invaluable uh, uh, service, and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.